Um, there we go. So hi, folks. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you were there when I joined just as uh, an observer or participant a few weeks ago, but Augusta Hopkins is a good friend of mine. We've known each other through the Dharma for many years, and it's a joy to get to visit and share with you all. And um, I see we have a nice little group, um, at least one person whose name I recognize, and you're so welcome to leave your cameras on off as you wish. I do, however, want to give us some moments to just have a little check in. Um, in particular, I guess the first week of or the first Monday of the month is a time when traditionally this group reads some mindfulness trainings, um, the Plum Village versions of the precepts and and variations upon those. So I wanted to know um, are folks interested in that? I had not remember that. And I put out a description for this week to get into the Four Noble Truths in daily life, which are entirely connected to the mindfulness trainings or the ethical trainings of the Dharma. But um, if folks want to speak, I know that this part will get cut out of the recording. So no worries about um, anything you say going public, um, but you can also write into the chat, um, maybe a few words about how you're showing up. And if you have a preference of a more sort of typical um, talk guided practice conversation or the more of a focus on the mindfulness trainings. So um, please feel free to speak if that's comfortable or to write something in the chat if that's comfortable, because I want to know how to make this time good, uh, helpful, hopefully, for all of us. I know so, if you're writing, it might take a few moments, but Julie? I was just wondering if you could go over the two options that folks Sure. again. Thank you. Okay. So one option is um, the Four Noble Truths. <laughs> the other option is, is actually um, a version or um, an inspired interpretation of the five precepts as put forth by a collective that I used to be part of called Arise Sangha, which focuses on racial justice and anti-oppression work within the Plum Village community. And so um, if you do want to write something in the chat of any preference, as well as a check in of um, you could just write like standard or mindfulness trainings. Um, I will probably touch on both anyway, but I just want to see what folks are up for and interested in. And I know sometimes even writing in the chat might feel like pressure. So um, hopefully it doesn't feel like too much pressure. Um, hopefully you're there. Hi. Okay. Leah, you're, <clears throat> you're on mute still. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Julia. I'm here in Boston and we'll likely need to sign off early because it's late here. Um, but I really wanted to thank you for being here. I'm not part of the this Sangha, so thank you all for welcoming me. Um, I would have a preference for what you prepared uh, to share with us. Okay, and I thank you. Um, I see another message on that same note. So, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm also in the Eastern time zone. <laughs> so um, I, I feel you and also Kareem. Uh, another friend is joining from the UK. So um, we will just jump right in. I will offer some reflections on the Four Noble Truths. We'll do our practice working with that. And then for those who can still stay, we'll have some space for conversation. Um, if you need to leave early and there's anything that you're wanting me to touch upon that will be in the recording, um, maybe at the end before we stop for conversation, go ahead and put something in the chat too. I'm not good at sort of following the chat as I'm talking, but um, 
just know that you can put things in the chat if you want it to be um, connected or explored, even if you can't stay till the end. Does that, hope that makes sense? Yeah, okay. Uh, so even though we've begun this time together, I like to call in um, teachers, lineage, ancestors, um, in the Plum Village tradition that I'm quite steeped in, we often start anything by by saying dear Thai, dear Sangha, as a way to really intentionally bring in awareness um, of our specific teacher. And, you know, that that whatever we're saying has the intention to be spoken with honor and integrity, as if knowing that the presence of our teacher is being evoked in the way that we are together. Um, and I like to evoke and invoke all of our spiritual teachers, Buddhist, non-Buddhist. Um, for me, my teachers in the insight tradition, especially through True North Insight, as well as my current teachers of Tanisara and Kitasaro, and my root teacher of Thich Nhat Hanh, and the whole Vietnamese Zen lineage, all of our teachers back to India in the Buddhist tradition. And I imagine that all of us have many traditions. So all of your spiritual teachers are really welcome. And, and what would it be like to just take a few moments and breathe into our hearts and, and acknowledge the gifts um, that we've received from all of our spiritual teachers and set an intention that this time this evening furthers the blessings, the wisdom of what we've already received. I'm also wanting to honor the lands, the earth herself that we are living upon, the traditional stewards of the lands. I know we're all in many different lands. Um, the cultural ancestors that we have been shaped by. Um, so in whatever way that works for you, and you may not even know what I'm talking about, so don't worry, don't worry about it, but some sort of, you know, grounding of, ah, earth is holding us, thank you. We are here because of those who came before us, some more skillful than others, and still enough skill to get us here. Thank you. And I also say this knowing that how I'm going to share what I'm sharing is entirely formed through all of my causes and conditions, all of my teachers. And so I don't mean to give, uh, you know, a final definition of anything, but after a few decades of practice, I've found some sort of nuances that have been really helpful for me. And so that's what I'm wanting to share tonight. I assume that a number of you are going to be familiar with the Four Noble Truths, and maybe some of you aren't. So uh, I know when I first heard about the Four Noble Truths, um, I was probably like 22 or 23, I picked up a book on Buddhism, and it started by saying, life is suffering, and I put the book down. And I didn't look at anything to do with Buddhism for some years, because I thought that's so pessimistic. Um, and then some years later, I found different variations and I found poems by Thich Nhat Hanh that opened my heart. And then I got interested in learning more and I've learned these nuances of, of in suffering there is life, uh, in life there is suffering. Not that everything is suffering all the time, but suffering happens. Uh, there's a source of suffering dukkha which can be dissatisfaction difficulty we'll get into that word there is cessation there's ending of suffering and there's a path that leads to that cessation or ending and taking a Han sometimes teaches the numbers in a flipped order where he would teach there is well-being that's his translation of the third truth and there's a path to well-being. And he taught, there is ill-being and there's a path to ill-being. And that was the variation of the Four Noble Truths that really started working in me when I heard that. I was like, oh, okay, 
<laughs> this, these words are simple enough. I think I get them. I'm curious. Um, and it's pointing to this, these teachings of conditionality and causation, that there are reasons things happen, not only linear A plus B equals C, um, you know, the causes and conditions are as vast as the entire universe. But, but tapping into a bit of like agency is really at the heart of these trainings, of this teaching that's at the center of all the Buddhist traditions. Um, and it started getting me really curious about like, well, what does bring about states of suffering? What does bring about states of well-being? And I've been looking at that a lot on a social, political level, but to start looking at that in terms of my own actions and my state of mind um, was profound exploration that still continues to this day. And after some years, I came across a more typical presentation of there is suffering in life, a cause or a craving conditions, this dukkha or suffering. There is cessation uh, of the suffering and there's a path that leads to the cessation. And after some time of practice, I started just falling in love with the original phrasing because it really made me face, oh, part of my brain keeps wanting there to be no suffering. <laughs> when I have a headache, when I'm stuck in traffic, when, um, when I'm being treated horribly or when I'm witnessing oppression and exploitation and environmental degradation in the world, there's a part of my brain that's saying this shouldn't happen. And in part, yeah, it's awful. And yet this, this somehow the, this first noble truth of like, this is what happens in life. Started working in its way in, and I started adding this tagline of, not because you did anything wrong, not because you didn't figure out a better plan, and not because you're being punished. And I realized I was carrying some old projections and interpretations from my own religious upbringing that had this sense of, oh, if things are hard, things are going wrong, maybe I did something wrong. And strangely, it was really liberating <laughs> to just get to take that away and go, wait a minute, what if I just deal with how it is without adding the extra layer of thoughts that are going, but it shouldn't be like this. And I also want to give a lot of caveats at the end of this, that this is by no means um, uh, an excuse to, um, to suffer abuse and exploitation. It's more the, the inner state like I am experiencing rage because of what's happening in the world and the first noble and second noble truth are this invitation to go what if it's not a problem that this rage is being experienced what if we stop adding the but it shouldn't be like this and that's where the second noble truth started to really come to life for me because when I heard it as like craving is the cause of dukkha I think I often took it pretty literally of like, well, if I'm wanting something, then that's dukkha. But there are other times where I wasn't overtly like wanting to pull something in, but I was still pretty miserable. Um, and started to interpret the second noble truth as when I want something different from my inner state, then dukkha happens. Which again was like still kind of tough, but it gave me something to work with. And so even today, you know, it's Labor Day here in Canada as well as in the States, and a lot of people had the day off. I had some things I was supposed to do, some connections with friends, but I didn't sleep well. I woke up with a backache, um, and my brain was just like kind of mush. And so as the afternoon wore on, I was getting pretty miserable. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, it's a holiday, but I can't even really relax because I have stuff to do, but I can't even think. And there's a, it wasn't a bad backache, but it's just enough of that pain not changing that tends to leave me in a pretty agitated mind state. Um, so that eventually 
as I went for a walk after dinner and was starting to get ready for this talk, I was like, well, I'm going to be sharing on the Four Noble Truths. <laughs> How can I apply this to the current dukkha? And bit by bit, I just started noticing that little, that little voice that is part and parcel with some muscular tension. I was going, oh, but come on, can it just be different? I wish, why, why didn't I get better sleep? I wish my brain was working better. I wish that I didn't have this pain. And so the way that I worked with that in the walk was just like starting to slow down my walk. And I was finding any parts of my body where I was resisting the pain and the foggy headedness. And by just getting softer and having less energy directed towards, I wish it wasn't like this. By the end of the walk, I still had a bit of backache and my brain was still a little foggy, but the dukkha was gone because I remembered <laughs> to apply the wisdom of the noble truths. And there's plenty of teachers, including Thich Nhat Hanh and others, and from my own experience too, that, that understand this third noble truth that there is cessation of dukkha, not just as a big bang, full nirvana, full Buddhahood, um, but any moment when dukkha ceases is to be noticed and celebrated. And I had some moments of cessation. So simple. I was just letting my body walk more softly and slowly, even with some pain. And then it was okay. And then there's the whole fourth noble truth of the, which we also call the noble eightfold path that there's a whole number of conditions that again, I keep creating these short forms because I don't always I don't always have the ability to hold all the lists and all the details at the same time. So I end up making sort of short forms in my mind. And my short form of the fourth noble truth, which has eight aspects to it, is your whole life is how you cultivate the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. And so I hope you're getting one of the things that I find the most exciting and important in this teaching is that though they're called the Four Noble Truths, some people call them the ennobling truths, and others call them tasks. Stephen Batchelor particularly likes to call these the Four Noble Tasks. Um, others, I think, use this wording too. And this shift from calling it a truth sounds like it's something you're supposed to believe in a statement of faith. That's how I heard it. And again, I was like, well, I don't know if I fully get it. And I don't, who cares what I'm believing, you know, but practicing with them and realizing these are tasks, these are things that can be done really simply while taking a walk with a backache, while, you know, dealing with technical difficulties, while dealing with big stuff and small stuff. Um, while living through this age of climate crisis and ongoing poly crisis. This is actually something that we can apply all the time. It's an invitation. It's this like present. That's, that's how I see it now. It's like this present that the Buddha is like, oh, <laughs> life is hard. <laughs> There's ways to get through it with a little more um, grace and a little more spaciousness and a little more okayness, please, here you go. <laughs> but the only way to apply them is to actually like, remember and to practice with them. And so talking about them is one of the ways to keep these alive. And when we move into our practice time, I'll be giving some instructions that, that take us through this, but I want to just add a few more little bits before moving into practice, which are, um, yeah, this, this caveat of, of this is not about tolerating abuse. And sometimes, I want to name, sometimes it happens, Dharma teachers, great Dharma teachers, your average practitioners, myself at many points in my practice, 
can take this training to go like, oh, well, it's all about what's happening in the mind and just don't look at what's happening in the outside life or just accept things, you know? If, if you're having a hard time, it's because you're not doing something right. And that, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> I, I bring it back to like, oh, yet more dukkha. Um, another misrepresentation, misuse of these, these teachings that um, I have total confidence the Buddha never meant <laughs> to use them in that way because he did speak to political leaders about trying to end wars. He didn't, you know, get up and put his body on the battlefield, but he did what he could where he had agency and sometimes he was effective and sometimes he wasn't, which I think is how we all live have to do what we can and sometimes we're effective and sometimes we aren't and that's why it's so important to have these sort of spiritual techniques or technologies um, tools knowing that sometimes we're not going to be able to change the outer situation and sometimes we are and no matter what's happening on the outside can we also not instead of but also be checking what's the inner narrative and experience. So I always want to name this is not about tolerating abuse and oppression. And the other piece that sometimes gets negated is that I think it's really important to add some of the, the nervous system wisdom uh, that's coming up through neuroscience and psychotherapy. And when I invite in the science, I know for a lot of folks, they when they blend the Dharma and science, it's often, um, oh, look, science validates this. So I guess it's real. And in that way, it kind of is, um, it's a colonial mindset. It's validating a modernity. Uh, science is real and everything else is um, antiquated or folklore or what those backwards people who believe in, in unseen things, that attitude of Western European enlightenment um, and coloniality. So I think it's really, really um, important to, to, to not buy into this idea that something that's proven by science, therefore, is the highest validity. And yet, there's a lot that's so wonderful and helpful that comes through sciences. And so for me, when I bring in the science, I, I hold them together. For me, the Dharma is the bigger truth. And it may or may not be for you, but that's how I'm holding it. And that's how I like to be sure to name it um, so that I'm not falling into the usual sort of Western dialogue of, oh, well, science proves it. And therefore, OK, well, we can believe this Buddhist thing. Um, but there's beautiful tools of bringing in when we're aware of what's the state of our nervous system, which is its own work, its own mindfulness practice. We're in time of like crisis and panic. It's not necessarily a time that we're going to be able to sit down and go, okay, well, so where's the craving? <laughs> What's wanting things to be different? How can I be working with um, my mind, my whole state to be experiencing less? Look at those are the moments we just need pure compassion. We need to take care of ourselves. And I've even found by looking into the suttas that, you know, when Kisa Gotami, um, someone who became an enlightened nut, first enlightened nun, um, when her baby had died and she was going around trying desperately to find someone to revive her baby, she came to the Buddha. He didn't say, so they're the Four Noble Truths and you're clearly not understanding the second one. Um, so I'm gonna give you a Dharma talk and tell you to go meditate. He didn't do that. He told her to go to a house where no one had died and find a master's seat and bring it back to her as this way to get her to go be with people. <laughs> and through lived experience, she came to understand the reality of death. But I think there's something deeply trauma informed in that. He didn't push her into something that wouldn't be appropriate to her nervous system state, to use today's language. And then after some time, when she was ready and wanted it, she went to the Buddha, she became a nun, she became one of the first enlightened nuns, and that's why we have her story today. So I think it's also important for us to like have awareness of how to apply these teachings. That yes, the way through suffering is 
is understanding the suffering, seeing where there's the grasping and wanting to be different and coming into the, the clarity and agency and surrender that allows for us to not need things to be different, which then makes everything different. <laughs> <laughs> and then realize that we can actually shape our whole life and cultivate our whole life to become a field from which awakening cessation of dukkha arises. Okay? It's not like this obligation, this thing you should do, but it's a potential that's actually living within every single human being. That when we choose, we can go there. Because I think we need to have this choice. It's never an obligation. It's never something that you get judged about, uh, or hopefully it's not something that we're judging ourselves about or feeling that that just have to like try harder. But but when there's that little or big light of inspiration, going, oh wait a minute, something different is possible than being stuck in my same cycles, of frustration and rage, um, and I want to do something different. That's where the Dharma is so brilliant. And that's where like the, the magic, the blessing, the alchemy of the Four Noble Truths can really change our lives. And I'm imagining a lot of you have already been practicing with this and I hope that you've already experienced some of this. I also hope that phrasing it in this way might give you just a few other little windows into this. Um, I was gonna add one more bit. I'll just add it in small, but if anyone had ever has read the, the turning of the wheel, the Dhamma is known as the first discourse of the Buddha. Um, often we get to the point where the Buddha describes the Four Noble Truths, and that's usually where a lot of teachings focus on. But if you continue in that sutta, there's a part where the Buddha is explaining how he came to these realizations. And in each of these realizations are these action words. And that's really the tasks embedded within these noble truths. So the invitation to understand dukkha, that's the first noble truth, which means we actually have to experience our hardships. And that's where it's important to know, like if you are outside your window of tolerance to use psychological language, or if, if you like, you're shutting down, you're completely spinning out, that's not a time. But when you're able to be with hard stuff and keep your feet on the ground, um, and it's actually a brilliant time to go, what's this rage actually feel like in my body? What's this heartache? What's the, what's the story of this heartache? And get curious, investigate the experience to understand, parinya is the word um, in the sutta. Just remembering, oh, what if I take this suffering as a chance to understand the nature of suffering in order to understand freedom from suffering. That's the task of the first noble truth. And then the releasing of the craving, finding some way to drop, to let go, to be free from wanting things to be different, wanting the inner painful experience to be different. That's the invitation of the second noble truth. The third noble truth, the cessation of dukkha, uh, of of the craving that causes dukkha is meant to be experienced. This almost never gets talked about, but the Buddha was really clear. When you don't have dukkha, notice it. We could say, enjoy it, savor it. Let it make neuro imprints if we want to use neurobiological language. Um, so important because so much I know for myself, so much practice can get focused on Where's the painful stuff? Where's the hard stuff? But the practice is also an invitation into, wow, where's the ease? Where's the relief? Where's the clarity? You, everyone experiences some clarity and relief, even wisdom. Thich Han can be pretty good at focusing on that. So maybe it's not so outside your scope if you've already been practicing in that tradition. And then finally cultivate the path, the fourth noble truth actively live your life in a way that supports more and more cessation of of suffering because it's good when we're, we're not we don't need to be suffering all the time the buddha is not saying oh well there's suffering you can't do anything about it He's saying 
I don't know, like, it's possible to live differently. Please, please accept this gift. <laughs> please tune into this potentiality that lives within everyone that we call Buddha nature. Um, so hopefully you can tell, I find this very exciting because of what it can actually mean when engaged with. And I love going back to teachings that can feel dry, that are maybe just presented as a list. And who cares, it's a list. <laughs> but then to find what's juicy in it and enlivening uh, in ways that I hope can bring you more capacity in life, I know it has for me. So thank you for your listening to this part of the sharing. And uh, I'm going to offer three sounds of the bell just to let this settle in. And then we're going to shift into a guided practice. I'm going to go for about a half hour. Guide the first half, and then we'll have some silent time as well. And check in first with the body. Does the posture it's in feel okay? Does it want to change? You are so welcome to do this lying down, standing, sitting. It could work also in walking, if you want to bring in the four traditional postures. Um, it's probably a little more geared towards a stationary posture. And then also notice like eyes open and downcast or closed. You may have a, a habit and a preference and something that works for you that's great, but it's also really helpful to just check in right now. What supports settling and awakening? easefulness and aliveness. Soft belly, strong spine. And a lot of folks I, I know often guide by like narrowing into an anchor first and then opening. If that works for you, go for it. I find it's, for me, it's actually really helpful to open and then collect. So that's the arc that I'm gonna guide us through. So opening to what's the experience in the body right now? What's happening on the physical sensation level? If there's a lot of information, you can just stay on the big picture, sort of noticing in broad strokes what sensations are present. If there is no whole lot of information, that's fine. There may not be many sensations right now. You can sort of scan through the body, maybe from head to toe, toe to head. And whatever we find, can we start to bring some of the wisdom of the Four Noble Truths into this inquiry? If there's discomfort, the mind might be carrying some, it should be different, I wish it was different, how can I make it different? 
what would it be like to soften and allow like, oh, this is how it is right now. To fight with reality a little bit less. If there are neutral or some pleasant sensations, it might be tempting or might be habitual for the mind to start spinning into, ooh, how can I make this last? How can I have more of this? And what would it be like to actually dwell in, go further into the neutral and pleasant sensations to just experience them here and now, to savor them with an open palm, letting neutral and pleasant sensations come and go, but to notice them instead of just staying focused on other things. So owning to the field of sensations in the body where is the pleasant, the unpleasant, and the neutral? Where is the resistance? Where is the savoring? Whatever we notice is fine, is welcome, is included. So adding what's happening in the realm of the other senses. So hearing, there's probably there's the sound of this voice arising and fading away. Maybe the hum of a fridge, traffic, neighbors on the ceiling, any other ambient sounds, pets your own breathing, it's tuning into the realm of sound. We don't always have as many reactions, but we might. Are there any that are kind of being pushed away? And what would it be like to not push it away? there's anything that's neutral or pleasant what would be like to not grasp it, but to just to savor it and let it move on. And you may be going from sounds to sensations to mind wandering. And coming back, what's happening in the realm of sound? And other senses, maybe there's a s aroma or odor in the room. Maybe there's a lingering taste of food in the mouth. If your eyes are open, there may be visual input. So opening to all the sense doors. As much as is okay. You don't have to catch everything. Just open awareness. And then noticing what is the mind trying to push away, change, suppress, ignore, even very subtle aversion. Very, very subtle. And where is there some cessation of dukkha suffering that could be noticed a little bit more? Mm -hmm. 
appreciated, appreciating the wholesome. And from here, this open awareness might want to settle, want to collect, maybe resting in body sensations or sound or the breath if you have a place you're used to anchoring into. And maybe there's so much happening, there's no settling happening. That's fine too. already sort of been doing this, but can we also include our thoughts and emotions in our inquiry, the mind realm of, uh, of what's being pushed away, what could be savored? What if it was okay that the mind's spinning? that we're touching some despair. Not in the long run, but just right now in this moment's experience, what if nothing needed to be excluded? What if we could turn towards with space but turn towards the heartache, the irritation, maybe even get a little smile and be like, hey, all right, we're doing this meditation together. Cool. Or Okay, I'm going to go to the other end of this football field, but we're going to, it's okay for you to stay with some space. And see what changes by not needing to push something away. There's bound to be moments where the discomfort, the bumpiness of life our minds lessens or ceases. Can we experience that? Actually notice moments of cessation, moments of awakening, little nirvanas here and now. So often we get ideas that cessation of dukkha or nirvana is this big lofty thing that we'll never experience and therefore we miss all these little moments that are actually already present. They're just so simple and subtle. They don't always make it onto the radar of our attention. And if there's doubt in the mind going, wait a minute, what is it? Is it like this? I'm not sure. Can we just soften? It's okay if we don't know for sure. Just play. We're playing here. 
It was Shinryu Suzuki Roshi who said, the Dharma is far too important to take it too seriously. So for the next 15 minutes or so, can we play with the heart mind stream? Release this, the, the pushing away of discomfort and notice the subtle, simple, already present moments of okayness, enoughness, relief from suffering. Mostly in silence, but every now and then I'll drop in a few words for those who appreciate that. Where is there resistance? Where is there relief? How can we meet this moment more fully?
possible to bring any more kindness, curiosity, clarity to this moment. With the pleasant, the unpleasant and the neutral. Turning again here and now, how is it? Seeing if it's possible to bring any more kindness, compassion, courage, rest, ease, into meeting this moment as it is.
Again, returning here and now. Resting into this moment with wakefulness. Willing to meet the 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows of each day. held in this inherent capacity of awakening to call our true home or Buddha mind, held by the earth, cosmic wisdom. In the final few minutes of formal practice, seeing if there is anything that has been learned, if there's anything to understand just a little bit more about the nature of Dukkha, about how wanting things to be different manifests and how it ceases and what conditions support the ceasing from our own experience. We don't need to analyze and bring in some strident thinking, but just a light openness, brief reflection on this last half hour. Hmm. Is there anything new or anything reaffirmed? about how we understand the process of the arising and the cessation of dukkha, the inherent dissatisfaction, the stress, the discomfort, the suffering that happens, not because we're being punished, not because we did something wrong or we didn't figure out the right plan. Because in life, these things happen these inner states that are hard to bear happen. So I'll offer three sounds, the bell to close the formal sitting.
If your eyes have been closed, they may want to open and see what it's like to take in sight, shapes and forms, and colors. If the body's been still, might be supportive to bring a little bit of movement back, some stretching. And can it be filled with kindness also and curiosity? I'd even want a little wiggle, a little, little shake. Sometimes I like to pat my face. <laughs> Tap on the heart. Yeah, any gestures that might feel good. You're welcome to offer them to yourselves. And we have some time for conversation. Um, so I think this would be where the recording stops or something gets edited at some point. Um, 